Current, batteries, and resistance. Okay, so we have uh, some goals for this session. We are going to start talking about the basic concepts of electric circuits as well as about the basic building blocks. We'll define current, we'll talk about what a battery does, and define resistance. And the final thing we'll do is talk about ski hills. So we're going to use a ski hill as an analogy with an electric circuit. So let's start with current. So the units for current are charge over time, coulombs per second. This is known as the ampere, or capital A, which is often referred to as amps. So our equation is current I is delta Q over delta T, Q being charge, T being time. Think about when you flip a light switch. How long does it take an electron in the wire right next to the switch to reach the, reach the filament in the light bulb? Is it almost instantaneous, or could it be a minute or even more? So what happens is, we can talk about drift velocities of electrons in the wire. And the electrons are moving about in random motion, but when you turn on the switch, that sets up an electric field, and that gets the electrons to drift uh, opposite to the direction of the field, in fact. But those velocities, those drift velocities, are superimposed on top of the random motion. It's, the drift velocities are very small, a millimeter per second. So if you've got a few meters to go, and then it takes you, you know, hundreds of seconds. So the time for an electron to get from the switch to the bulb can be a few minutes. But, of course, we know the bulb comes on right away. And that's because the electric field is set up almost instantaneously in the conductor when you flip the switch. And then all the electrons acquire that uh, drift velocity. And there are lots of electrons just ready to go all along the wires, including one right next to the filament, or even in the filament, and those start drifting and their energy uh, lights up the bulb. Okay, so let's kind of look at this uh, here. So here we have the circuit with the switch open. So this is a circuit diagram. We've got a battery. That's the thing with the two lines. We've got a switch. That's the arrow. And the squiggly thing is the resistor. Okay. These red things are positive charges flowing through the wire around the circuit, and they just keep going and going. And that squiggly thing might be a toaster element or a light bulb. Uh, filament, something like that. Now, really, we know that uh, it's not positive charges that flow. It's negatives that flow in the external circuit. So here, this is a more realistic picture. Uh, inside the battery, it's positive charges that are flowing. Outside, it's electrons. And really focus on the terminals of the battery, because what you would see is every once in a while, uh, there'd be a magical thing happen, and at the negative terminal, an electron would emerge as well as a positive charge and at the positive terminal every once in a while the electron vanishes as well as the positive charge. Now this is not magic of course it is chemistry so let's just briefly talk about how a battery works and the neat thing about a battery is an entire electron manufacturing process sealed up in a little packet so it's pretty cool so we've got a chemical reaction that uh, frees up electrons at the negative electrode and those flow around the external circuit through the light bulb filaments or your TV or whatever uh, to the positive terminal and then another chemical reaction recycles those electrons. Now the electrodes of course are used up in this process and waste products like any other manufacturing uh, process are produced and that's why batteries run out. Some batteries are rechargeable, which means you can run the chemical reactions in reverse to repair those electrodes, but you can only do that so many times. And some of you might have heard about fuel cells, and they're a lot like batteries, but instead of being uh, the raw materials being packaged in a uh, little box, the raw materials are constantly added and waste products are constantly removed. If you think about the lead acid battery, very common battery, it's in your car. Uh, consists of two electrodes. One is lead, the other one's from lead dioxide. And what's the acid? Well, that's the solution of sulfuric acid, nasty stuff, in the battery itself. Okay, so let's look, look at the chemical reaction that frees up the electrons. You get the lead electrode. Uh, the HSO4 minus is coming from the sulfuric acid. You get PBSO4, that's one of your waste products. H plus, that's important. And especially important, the two electrodes, two electrons, sorry, 
that go off through the circuit. And then at the other terminal, you get this happening. This is the PBO2 uh, electrode. Combine that with some more HSO4 minus three H plus ions, the two electrons that come back from the external circuit, and you bind those up in a couple of water molecules and some more PBSO4. And critical thing about this is that to maintain these reactions, H plus ions have to flow inside the battery from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. Okay, now we're just going to talk about resistance and Ohm's law. So any electrical device uh, resists the flow of charge and has some resistance to flow, and that's the ratio of the potential difference across it to the current through it. So we can write Ohm's law like this, R is delta V over I, or often you see Ohm's law like the following delta V, the voltage or potential difference across a device is the current through it multiplied by its resistance. Units for resistance is what we call the ohm. Okay, so we can use our R is delta V over I equation. In this example, we have a 5 volt battery on the left hand side, and it's providing a current of 1 amp, and that black thing is the resistor. It's providing some resistance to flow. Okay, you should be able to figure out that the resistance is 5 ohms in this circuit. Okay, on the right, we then double the resistance, we make it twice as long, the resistor, so the resistance is twice as big, and we get half the current there. Okay, so we get 10 ohms, 5 volts and 10 ohms gets you half the current, half an amp of current. And this is a good way to think about Ohm's law, if you have a battery connected to a resistor, how much current is provided, well you can do it like this. The current is the voltage divided by the resistance. Okay, so many materials have a constant resistance, not all of them, but if you do have a constant resistance, then you can use Ohm's law. And the resistance, again, is a measure of how difficult it is for charges to flow. And it depends on uh, what we call the resistivity. That's a constant that depends on the material, the length of the object, and the cross-sectional area. So if you have a cylinder, it's resisting to the flow of charge. Uh, more resistance comes from more length or smaller area or a uh, big resistivity value. Okay, so here's some resistivity values. Very large range here, about 24 orders of magnitude. Note that copper is an example of a uh, conductor. Teflon and rubber are examples of insulators and silicons. A semiconductor is kind of in between. Okay, then we can talk about temperature dependence. And light bulbs, for instance, don't have a constant resistance their resistance depends on temperature, and they depend on temperature like this. If you know what the uh, initial resistivity is, is at some base temperature, then you can say, well, my base resistivity rho i multiplied by 1 plus alpha delta t, delta t is the change in temperature, gets me the new resistivity, or you bind that into resistance equation like that. Alpha here is the temperature coefficient of resistivity. Okay, looks a lot like the uh, length equation, if you remember the length uh, expansion equation, but these are different alphas. This is the temperature coefficient of resistivity. In the length equation, we have the temperature coefficient of uh, just length. Um, and the one for resistivity is quite a, large, quite a much larger number than the one for length. Okay, final thing we want to do is talk about the ski heel analogy. So we can talk about the chairlift is the battery, the skiers as the charges, and the trails on the ski heel as these resistors. Okay, so we can see this uh, flow of skiers around the ski hill here. And so the chairlift lifts them up to the top of the mountain. They all ski down through one trail, and then they decide to go left or right. Looks like the trail on the left is a little bit more difficult than the one on the right. Fewer skiers choose that one. So there's a lower current. Now, if something happens on the one on the right, okay, that will interrupt the flow through that one. Okay, there's some accident, or for some reason there's no snow, so no skiers go that way. Uh, one thing is the chairlift slows down, doesn't run as fast, so that people don't pile up at the top. Okay, so that's a good view of, of that. Thanks for uh, listening to that.